Hi, folks. Uh, so we're here today to talk about business. And um, I'm going to do a little bit of introductions. I'm going to talk about what we're going to talk about and kind of some of where I'm coming from as someone that has made things out of clay, but I am definitely not a ceramic artist. Um, and then we're going to dive into a bunch of questions, have a conversation, and then we'll have time for questions from the audience too, so save those up. Um, so first of all, I'll introduce myself, and we have one slide. I think we're probably the most slide-free presentation here. Uh, uh, my name is Kate Strathman. I am a Philadelphia-based founder and director of a consulting company called Wanderwell. And we are a firm that serves a motley crew of creative, mission-driven businesses with financial and strategic services that all center humans and care and community. And my degree is in studio art. I was a printmaker. Um, and my first and only full-time job in my life was at the Walker Art Center way back a while ago. Um, in the six years that I've been running Wanderwell, my team and I have supported literally hundreds of small businesses, many led by artists and makers. Um, Dustin Yeager, right here. Uh, his work deals with perceptions of identity, taste, and all that goes along with it. He earned an MA in Visual and Critical Studies from SAIC and a BA from Carleton College. Now based in Brooklyn, New York, Jaeger previously oversaw education and artist grant programs at Northern Clay Center. Through his business, Ceramics and Theory, he has been working with galleries since 2011 and then began formalizing his business more towards full time in about 2017. Um, Liz Pikachek, did I do it right? Great, yes. <laughs> was raised in Indianapolis, Indiana by her artist mother and chemist father and grew up making all manner of things. She earned a BFA in ceramics, a BA in art history from Indiana University in 2012. She now operates her studio and business full-time in Minneapolis, Minnesota, while also maintaining a teaching practice here. Sean Forrest Roberts on the end here runs Forrest Ceramic Company from Orcas Island, Washington, where he has been in business for over five years, the past three of those full time. His background and training in chemistry at Carleton College inspires an experimental studio practice, which led to the unique marbled and carved colored porcelain designs he is known for. Sean is originally from Madison, Wisconsin, and started creating ceramics at the age of 16. Um, before we dive in, I'd love to ask, get a raise of hands from the audience. Um, who here owns a business? Oh, nice. Um, who here identifies primarily as an artist or a maker? Who here makes money from their work but doesn't consider themselves a business owner? Nice. Who here is still questioning their identity and has no idea what they're really doing? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> cool. So, as a business owner and consultant who also identifies as an artist, I'm always interested in the imperfect ways that we figure out our identities as makers, as artists, as entrepreneurs, and how we navigate the sometimes seemingly conflicting forces of creativity and commerce. So one of my core beliefs uh, in my work is that businesses are spaces to experiment and create models for the larger worlds that we want to live in. This is something that Winona LaDuke spoke to last night and talking about how individual hands are what makes change. So I, I believe this is something that art and business share at their core. And I essentially, uh, when pressed, run my business much like an art practice um, in that it's a creative space. It's full of experiments. Some are total failures um, where I get to with my team create conditions um, to respond to the larger world in the context that we live in. Um, so there's a little bit of utopia in that, but it's also, you know, there's money too. It's practical. Um, the larger context is often capitalism. Capitalism tells us that our worth is tied to our productivity and the amount of money we make. As artists and makers, I think we know that this is not how we generally want to approach our lives and our work. Um, so, begs the question, was a business? Uh, one definition of business is that it's a repeatable process that makes money. 
I think this is really key to understanding the difference between a business and a hobby or a side hustle. It's that repeatability piece. Um, but another definition of business is a experimental process of exchange that meets needs. And those needs can be concrete, like income, like gotta pay the rent, gotta pay the mortgage. Uh, they can also be creative and spiritual. Uh, they can be about recognition or being seen in the world. And they can also be relational, about our relationships to our work, our businesses, how those needs are fulfilled, our relationships with our customers and clients, and our relationships with ourselves too, I think. Um, I do think that potters and ceramic artists in business really understand these relational nuances. Um, creating business at the intersection of art, of beauty, of what's functional, of design, of a whole mix of these things will really give you that lens. Um, so with this panel, we brought together three different business owners who are in kind of different stages of business, I think, as we've talked about amongst each other. And uh, we're just gonna get into a conversation about identity, uh, about the nitty gritty, sort of pulling back the curtain of the innards of the business. We're gonna talk about money and revenue and scary things like that that nobody really ever talks about. Um, and we'll dive in. So I wanted to start actually with the identity piece. And um, Liz, I know that you know, you've spoken about having a real fine arts practice that sits alongside your business practice. And so I wanted to kind of start there and just ask you how you think about your identity as an artist, as a brand, as a business, mm -hmm. and how does that inform and uh, shape your business and your work? Um, well, um, one thing that is really important in my own business is that I continue to be excited and engaged with the work that I'm doing. And I find that in order to do that, that I need to have a certain level of experimentation. And there's um, this moment of thinking to myself, what's happening? Is it working? You know, that, like, that uh, feeling and that question, if I'm not asking myself that enough, then I start to get burned out. And I feel like I'm just sort of working in my studio, making work. And like, like, uh, like I could, anyone could make it. It could be a factory situation, you know? Um, and the, there's a lot of overlap between the two. They're not two distinct um, bodies of work. And when I said factory situation, what I meant was, like, I feel like I'm in a little sweatshop of one, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, because, like, my hourly rate really isn't that good, you know? Like, um, <laughs> so if I'm not getting something emotionally, spiritually, artistically out of it, then, um, then, then I kind of start to wither a little, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, Dustin, what about you? You also have an art practice that sort of sits alongside your production practice and making things too. How do you think about that and how does it work with yeah, your business? Yeah, I think about it, I think pretty differently because I've thought about it for a while as two parallel tracks that aren't necessarily very related and have pretty distinct looks between the ceramics and theory body of production pottery to sell and the more sculptural vessels, conceptual pieces that I make. And I think that um, those kind of go back and forth. For three or four years, I've been making conceptual pieces when I want to apply for something or when I have a deadline or a show that I need to be in. I can switch over to that and kind of fit it in between kiln loads of pots that have to go to sell somewhere. Um, but for both of them, I, I didn't really set out to be at this table, right, set out to be anyone who talks about business or thinks about my practice as a business in any way. So um, how they've developed side by side is really related to that. And also the opposite side of I focus on the business, on the production pots when I have to pay the bills, when it has to make money, and then that supports the sculptural practice uh, beside it. Do you feel like you're ever you're fighting for time around those or space ever? Yeah, yeah, and I think I gloss over that for myself because I know, <clears throat> oh, I can make time to make a sculpture on a Sunday afternoon, but it definitely feels like what I want to think about my 40 hours a week as is pottery, and then what I want to do in my 
I feel like when I'm a sculptor, that needs to bite into my private time a little more. <laughs> but as I grow in this business thing, I um, want to find a way for that sculptural side to contribute financially as well. Mm -hmm. Sean, what about you? You're, you're the one with the chemistry degree. <laughs> So I know you're coming at this from a little bit of a different yeah. space. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I started doing ceramics when I was 16, like you said, sophomore in high school, fell in love with throwing on the wheel. Um, worked in the ceramic studio at Carleton College because I had a lot of experience. I was a TA by the time I was a senior in ceramics. Uh, went to pottery camp and all that and loved it. But I was always a math and science person, so I was studying chemistry. So I would always have said, you know, that I'm a ceramic artist as a hobby. You know, it wasn't what I was studying, it wasn't what I was trying to do. And I would even say that, I used to say to people all the time, like, I couldn't make this my profession because I would lose the love of it, you know? I love throwing because I don't have to throw and, and sell the pieces. I started selling even when I was in high school. So that was where I got started and then um, even after graduating college and deciding I didn't want to work in a, in a, in a chemistry laboratory, um, I went and kept doing ceramics, but it was on the side. And I was having a full-time job and experimenting and having fun and going into glaze chemistry. So I still, at that point, would call myself a ceramic artist as a hobby, pretty much. Um, and then I moved to Orcas Island and started making a body of work that started selling really well. You know, it was from my experimentation. I was marbling in the studio with clays um, at the University of Wisconsin, learned to slip cast, basically just got a mold demo and kind of went at it. I was making molds of, uh, I was making, I made a mold of a Frisbee for um, a project that I was gonna throw Frisbees off of cliffs and they would shatter. And I started mixing color into my clay and it just went from there. So. All this is just to say that it was from experimentation and I was doing it for fun, and that was the most important thing. And then when the business presented itself to me because cups were flying off of shelves and I was making more money there. Can you talk about I, how that happened? Cups flying off shelves? Yeah, like, like what was, because there was like other was peop, a, there was people place, on the other side of that. Yeah, absolutely. So it was partly the place. I went to Orcas Island, um, yeah. and it's a very touristy destination. And um, I have a lovely partner who came, started coming to the studio and was like, we need more color. And, <laughs> we're, and he was playing and helping me make stuff and pushing things forward. Um, but it was just something really different. You know, I still have people come up to me in a booth at a show and say like, what is this? What, what, what material is this? What? And so it's different and it's really exciting to people in that way. Um, and I was working still full time as a baker, and I decided, you know, I gave them six months' notice. I'm going to go full time with this business, and that was 2014, um, and just pushed. And at this point now, I have two employees uh, in the studio, and my partner's still in the studio helping every day. And but in terms of identity, going back to that, you know, when people ask me what I do, I still say I own a ceramics business. I don't say I'm a ceramic artist, and I don't know what you two would say about that. Like, do you say you're a ceramic business? The business side of things, it's like I'm making, the art was the conception of the original piece, but once you have to make hundreds of them, thousands maybe, over years, it's a product that every single one's different, and it is still made by hand, but um, it's a product and I'm, more of a business person managing two employees and then, but there needs to be that side. The art side is still experimenting in the studio. There's always gonna be yeah. experimentation and that's where you get, that's what keeps you in it and keeps it fresh because working, you know, 100 hours a week, it's a We'll lot. get to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dustin, yeah. can, uh, can you tell us about what the structure of your business is right now? Like. What are the components? Like, what are you doing in the studio? Uh, what does that look like for you? Yeah, I think we've talked a little before that that even the umbrella of what is my business, right? Because in my how I split up my week is teaching five classes and then trying to spend most of the other hours in the studio. So I I. Um, 
uh, I'm mostly one person. I have a very part-time assistant who will come in and help mostly with packing and polishing and some social media and photography things, which is super valuable and has freed up a lot of time for me. But for the most part, I'm following that Studio Potter model of doing all of the things. So mm -hmm. throwing, glazing, promoting, mm -hmm. ordering supplies. How many pieces do you think you make in, or sell in a month? Oh, well, it varies so much yeah. month to month. I don't think, I don't think that's... Right, but I think you made us give you made us do numbers. It gets <laughs> it gets it gets very solid right now. In 2017, I think I sold about a thousand things over uh -huh. the year, of different sizes and prices. Last year, I thought that would go up a little bit, but I kind of just kind of averaged how many things fit in a kiln, how many times did I fire, what's left in my studio. I think I sold at least 1,500 last year. Uh -huh. Which felt, which was more than I expected that yeah. that number to come up as. Um, I'll ask you one more. How do you think about the current stage of growth of your business, like, or it's just stage? Like, is it, is it like a two-year-old? Is it like an eight-year-old hmm. that's making it so it snacks every once in a while? Like, oh, how there's do lots you of think snacks. About um, I, uh, I go back and forth, the feeling like. This is at a good stage. Let's do an Encica panel. To like, <laughs> yeah. oh, I'm not the person who should be here at all. So I have to remind myself in the more like um, philosophical side, right? Yeah. That like you, it's successful if you're paying rent and paying yourself and paying the bills. So in that way, it's yeah, it's on its feet. That's fine. But I don't see a, a direct path, a clear way to go full time, right? To not be teaching as much as I teach now. So, and that's OK. I also have to realize, like, well, that's a career path that a lot of people have chosen and choose and would even seek out. So um, I would like to spend a little more time in the studio and a little less time teaching as a near-term goal. Does that answer, kind yeah, of? Yeah. Liz, what about you? How do you, what's the structure of your business right now? I know you've sort of, you've had more help and now less help. Mm -hmm. How do you think about that? Uh, I, I've settled into um, something that is working for me right now, which is I have someone who comes two days a week for six hours each time, so uh, 12 hours a week. And she's been working for me for about um, five years now. So she's, she knows her stuff. We've got a good rhythm, you know. She, uh, she does all the casting, and she attaches the handles, and she sands everything. Um, so she kind of, like, provides me with the blanks, and then I uh, am able to go back in with the surface. So I call it feeding the machine, you know. <laughs> so you know, feed the machine and then keep checking along. Um, and uh, it's... Um, you know, I pay her pretty well because it's my ethos, and um, it definitely cuts into my profit. Like, uh, it, I could potentially be making more money if I was paying her less. Um, <laughs> but uh, but it, it has allowed me, because I am able to have a higher level of output to do more things. So the holistic sense of, like, my artistic repertoire I'm able to do more shows I'm able to say yes to things that are a good opportunity because you know because I have her help in the studio you know and she's very reliable and she knows what she's doing so that's great you nice. know. Nice. Sean how do you think about the current stage of your business been thinking about how to answer that while you all are I mean it's really interesting and it's hard to decide when you're at a good stage right I've been growing steadily year by year not too fast, I've been letting it happen naturally, but um, I feel like I could be in the toddler stage or I could cut it off and try to keep, you know, just stay where I am. Um, I've let things happen in the sense that, you know, I was looking for an employee for a really long time and then um, I've been through four different employees now who were, you know, it was planned that they were gonna come and leave. Now I have an employee that lives on the island and is sticking around. One of my previous employees went to get a, like a new real job with a big company, hated it, and came back. So that's my second employee right now who has a design background, and I get to have do a lot of, like, can do the photography and the website and that kind of thing, which is really great. And so she only works two days a week. Um, and 
both of my other previous employees now want to come back also. <laughs> That's a but good I don't sign. Have, <laughs> but I don't have room for that in the studio. So it's like, what's going to be the next step? I need a bigger studio. I'm going to make more. And you know, you asked about output. Like I, I sell wholesale. Um, I have to crank a lot. We go through a lot of pieces, and with with that help in the studio. You know, I sell fourteen dollar cups to to a store. Um, kind of lost my train of thought there, but Great. is is it going to be? Yeah, do I go bigger? Do I keep selling more of those? Can I? Because um, I still have to do all the design work, yep. right? Of the making the design, yeah. they can glaze and load kilns and sand and all that sort of thing. But and is that what I want? Because as you move forward. You're, and I think you mentioned this, Liz, mm -hmm. about not liking managing the people. Totally. And so you sort of back down and downsize. It's like the more that I'm managing my employees, the less I'm doing mm -hmm. um, for a little while until they get, you know, it, there's always, at this point, my s second employee has been with me for like eight months. And at this time, at this point, I don't have to manage her nearly as much. But if I took on someone new, I would have to manage them a lot for a long yep. time. I have to teach someone everything, you know, and double check and triple check all of their work. And um, yeah, so I guess really I just don't know where I'm at. And yeah. it's hard to make those decisions about should I go bigger, should I cut back? I still work, you know, between emails, going to the studio, coming home, more emails seven days a week, 100 hours, like I said probably, and it's like at some point, I need to learn some balance. <laughs> well, f for me, in terms of toddler stage, I think getting to the point where I could have an assistant come do anything was major, yeah. to realize that there are things that aren't worth my time to do, that aren't that I'm not good at doing, and to ask someone to come in really felt like a big step forward, and something that a decision to advertise for an intern that I agonized over and then never looked back once there's a capable pair of hands next to you. Yeah. Um, building off of that, Tessa, is there anything you wish you had learned in school that you had to learn the hard way through your business? Mm -hmm. That play like can be a business. <laughs> right? that, that there are careers in art <laughs> is important. Um, I, you know, it's actually, it's only I, sort of a trick question. <laughs> well, as I've talked about this, I also always want to put the caveat up front for students and for young folks starting off to say, like, you don't have to be a business. That none of our lives or schemes should be a model to, because it should be primarily about the fun and the discovery, right? So I don't. I think that starting to think about taxes too early is such a turnoff that I, w I <laughs> wouldn't want to learn Probably that. I wouldn't want to learn that in school, actually. Totally. Um, when we were chatting last week, uh, we, were, I, we talked about like what are common startup questions, like when people come up to you and are just starting out, and you know what are those questions that folks ask? And one of them, and I get this too, like in my work, is how do I sell things? How do I sell more things? And I think like my sort of uh, impertinent answer to that is always like, who the hell knows? We're all trying <laughs> to figure that out. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but that's not super helpful. So, <laughs> but I think it's a, but it's another way of saying that like we are all always figuring out this game and like what mm. what are those mechanisms of repeatable process and exchange? So. Um, Maybe Liz, you want to start. Like, where do your sales come from? Uh, what's worked for you? What's not worked for you in building up sales and places to sell and customers? Uh, well, uh, I, I would say that the number one thing that works uh, well is to be flexible and to um, realistically look at your numbers at the end of the year and keep good numbers so that you know like where where things are profitable and where mm -hmm. things aren't and what opportunities are worth taking again and what ones are you might want to replace with something else. I sell at craft shows, like the American Craft Council show and the PMA show in Philadelphia. And I sell through galleries on a consignment basis. And I sell wholesale to shops, um, mostly like uh, gift shops, museum gift shops, that kind of thing. And I also sell directly to customers from my Instagram and my website. 
Um, and so the, the income is like a, is a, a mishmash of all of those things. And sometimes a great big order will come along and that's a huge part of my revenue for, you know, the next couple months. And sometimes um, it's like crickets, you know, and I'm really happy to go to a big, a big show like the ACC or something because I'll get, I know I'm going to make some money, you know. Um, so <coughs> like that, that's, that's the way that I see it. And I just try to be cognizant of what's working. I do have some growth areas, some goals that I would like to be selling more off of my website and making more direct sales. And my strategy is to increase my web presence and engage with my um, with my like web following more in order to do that. Like sort of give permission to people that they can approach me, mm. a li make it a little bit easier. Yep. Um, and we'll see. I, it has helped. Mm. Yeah. Um, Sean, what about you? You mentioned wholesale, obviously. Yeah, so what are I the mean, other pieces? Where are you selling? What's working? Yeah, and literally, I think, like you're saying, is people are asking you, how do I sell more? And I think you try everything. And I have tried everything, and I do pretty much all of the, all the ways that I feel like I possibly can sell something, I've, I've tried. You know, so I do wholesale to stores, very little, um, because I don't have the stock in general. Um, and I, I do shows as well. I do the farmer's market on Orcas Island and I sell through a couple stores there, um, and then I do web sales. And you know, at the beginning, the web sales was what, hardly anything. <laughs> so, so <good. laughs> um, at the beginning, you know, when I first... <laughs> Did say there would be paparazzi? I'm natural. I when I first started my company, I hardly had any web sales, right? I had a website, but there wasn't anything moving there. And when I first went full time with the business, I still hadn't even created an Instagram. Um, so the in-person sales is definitely like the way to start, I think, because you can explain the product. And you know, I'm, I was lucky that my product was something different and people were buying it off of shelves as well um, at those couple stores. So that was my start, it was consignment, um, and, and in-person sales, doing uh, the shows and whatnot. And I think that's the best way to start your growth, engage with your customer. Uh, and then Instagram and web presence is, is great as well. And that's been the biggest growing portion of my business, absolutely. Uh, whereas, you know, at the beginning, I maybe, you know, the first year I did 10,000 in sales, well, no, but third year I did tens of thousands in sales on the website, and that was a small portion of the sales of the year. Um, and now it's getting closer to like half of my sales are going mm -hmm. through the website. That's awesome. But uh, yeah, I mean it hasn't gotten to the summer yet, right? So I have a very seasonal basis: the shows that I do in the summer, and then there's the shows for the holidays. I do sh two in the summer and three during the holidays on the West Coast. And I've kind of cut it off at that because I feel like, you know, shows can shows are amazing, but it's also a lot of time away from the studio, traveling. Mm -hmm. um, I did come all the way here to St. Paul for the ACC show last year, and uh, it was it was a good show, but I was gone for like two weeks. I drove all the way from Works Island to here because I had to, and I got some wholesale clients out of it. I got some stores in in the Midwest, which was great. But um, again, yeah, it's like, an award? I did, yeah. Nice. I, I, they gave me an award. They, they wanted me to come back. They invited me back, and I said, like, sorry, I can't do the drive again. It was kind of scary going over the mountains and being like, wait, what if there was a snowstorm? Because it's still April, and it's the mountains, and then I wouldn't have been able to come, and I paid $1,200 to be in the show, you know? Mm -hmm. So the, those types of shows, you have to know that you're going to make money because they cost a lot of money, too. Um, so I guess trying to not do too many shows and trying to go through the other routes is kind of what I've been trying to do more yeah. lately. But shows are, you know, certain shows that are nearby, they're still like really good. They're a really big portion of my sales. And obviously wholesale is the whole, it's like the question is how, how much can you make? How cheap can you sell it, right? Because wholesale, when you're selling through a store, you're taking 50% of the cut. Yep. Yep. So you're getting half of what you would be selling yep. it for. And I've never, if I 
grow the business more and get more employees and maybe I could offer and try to push to do more wholesale. But at this point, kind of lucky to be in a place where I most of what I can make, I sell through other routes. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Tessa, what about you? Mm -hmm. You have a different path. But... Mm, do I? Well, I think the revenue streams that we talk about are the revenue streams, right? Wholesale, yeah. retail, web, and consignment are the four that I try to track separately so I can see what's good, what's not good. And I, th I have, most of mine I think is probably wholesale that I do right now. Um, and, I, and I like that. And I think it, I have to give myself permission to, I don't love the meet and greet of retail shows. I, and I don't think that's where my skills are. So if, that, if I can save the stress of that and yeah. just be in the studio making work for wholesale, it's OK. If you're the kind of person who likes to meet and explain the work and talk to the people, then retail shows are a great skill to have, to go that route. I would also put on the map Liz, I know you've done some design work and working with brands and, and bigger companies as well. So there's like a design commission um, sales bucket. And then that all those things kind of fit into pottery, right? That's like your ceramic business. But if we think of ourselves as designers of lifestyle goods or related to other product categories, then we can think about like, well, I, I designed some brass pins. So there's a part of my business that's from this other product that I make. Do you print, um, you know, textiles or other sorts of things that can fit into your brand or your artistic expression? So there's a bullet point for my plan of, of um, other product categories that could feed the beast as well. Do you see yourself growing that part of your work? Sure. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. And, and maybe that gets into, I feel, starved for time, right? Yeah. I feel like yep. the development and creative process of doing something like that is not, um, doesn't f neatly fit into my week right now. And I'm also knowing that I'm training myself to come out of having a part-time job for the past several years. So I'm really feeling like I'm learning how to be creative again in a yeah. lot of ways. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I want to shift into like, we've talked a little bit about numbers, but I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of transparent conversations about money because I think we don't do it enough. And it can be such a relief to kind of really understand what's happening. And like, especially these days, like, I think, Sean, we've talked about this, like, sometimes the, the distance between Instagram and real life can be really far when you start to look at the numbers and things like that. So, but, you know, I also, context is also really important. Because I think one, one of the things that happens when we don't talk about money enough is that, like, numbers start to not, they mean different things depending on what's happening and whether you have employees or not and all of these things, and that's really important. Um, so, I'd love to, like, just ask, Dustin, I'll start with you, what, what numbers are important to you? Uh, like, if you want to share what sort of different kinds of revenue and what that's looked like for you over the years and what your expenses look like, that's awesome. But, like, how do you, um, I know, like, we've worked together on this stuff and talked about it a lot. Yeah. How do you think about numbers in your business? What are the ones that are important to you? The positive ones. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, the numbers that we had talked about over the past month or so is like revenue, the total of all of the income. Um, do you want us to share numbers? Yeah, yeah. I love so, that. So I was looking at my notes from what we'd sent back and forth and saw that in 2017, my revenue was about $37,000 from pottery, from not from teaching. But half of that was expenses. So my actual profit was about $18,000, and then there's other like taxes and lots of And that's of not paying yourself there. either. That's, that is right. all that I paid right. myself, right? right? right. So, so that's the number, um, which is like, great. OK, that's a spot on the map. That's worth tracking. And then I can think about, well, this is the year I moved. This is the year I built studio equipment. This is the year I bought a kiln. So there's lots of ways I can say, but really, I made more. And then in 2018, I still haven't met my tax person, but it looks like that kind of doubled. 
But that's also very deceptive because my studio rent has gone up and I'm also having income from subletting parts of my studio. So my revenue got a lot bigger, but my profit is actually really close to the same. And that's uh, fine, that's cool, that's success, but also a little scary to think about, oh, my revenue grew so much, but my take home pay stayed the same. Have to turn that around for 2019. Cool. Uh, Liz? Um, <clears throat> so, um, the uh, first year that I was in business, um, where I declared my DBA and um, was filing taxes as a self-employed individual, um, a, uh, a, what do you call it, sole proprietor, I uh, brought in $30,000 in sales. And I remember at the time thinking like, whoa, I sold $30,000 worth of ceramics. Like, that is just awesome. And, it, and then my actual take home was around half that, you know, maybe a little bit more actually, because I keep like a super low overhead. My studio is in my house and I wasn't, I didn't have as much help in the studio then. And I um, uh, also just, uh, I, I think that I wasn't investing in my infrastructure as much. I was just doing everything super duper cheap. Um, and then the next year I made about 10,000 more and about half of it went to expenses. And then the next year I made about 10,000 more and then about half went to expenses. And then the next year I didn't, I, I made about 10,000 more, but a little more went to expenses because I was experimenting with have more, having more contract labor to help um, try to boost like the, my output. Um, and I did boost more output. I made more sales, but it didn't like even out. And that was part of my decision to reduce some of the contract mm -hmm. labor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, what kind of growth are you working towards now? Um, if any. I, uh, I would like to have a slightly better quality of life. Um, yeah. That, <laughs> like. Uh, <laughs> that's, the, that's the next question. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's like my main thing. I, um, like, I, I'm pretty comfortable on the income that I'm making right now, although I'm not saving as much as I would like, and um, retirement is an issue. Although, uh, I, I just gotta say it, I got married this year, and it really helped. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like, I'm like, wow, I haven't been worried about money in a while. I, you know, what's the difference? There should be a business service about that. Yeah, like a like, dating slash. Yeah, like get, get married, <laughs> save your taxes for entrepreneurs. <laughs> so, you know, there's that. But, um, yeah, you know, I'm just getting a little worn down. I got I got eczema on my eye. And whenever it's happened, the second time it's happened this year, and it's when I'm not sleeping enough and I'm making too many pots, I get eczema on my eye. <laughs> and then I start sleeping more, and then the eczema goes away. And I'm like, oh, this is nice, you know. And so, like, I'd really like to have a lifestyle where I don't just regularly get eczema on my eye. <laughs> That's a really good call. <laughs> well, can I? I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit, and then I'll come back about numbers, Sean. But uh, I guess how do, how do you think about sustainability for yourself for the future? Mm -hmm. Like, what need, what's gonna change for you to make that possible? Um, well, so I uh, do you know uh, Molly Hatch? So I took her Thrive thing. Whenever she does a course, I take it basically because I just I, it's like a hundred bucks. Like, come on, you know. Um, and uh, I was thinking, you know, maybe I should try to find a licensing agent because my problem is I have no passive income. Every income source that I have, I like literally make the thing at, at some step because so much of the work is like in the surface you know even though like I can make the forms with my assistant like I've tried having someone help me with the surface and it just really f I feel divorced from the work in a way that is not productive um, and also I can't handle the dip in quality you know like I, I'm a perfectionist and my really high craftsmanship is part of my brand so I can't sacrifice it mm -hmm. you know so I was thinking you know like wow that sounds great if I had you know a licensing agent maybe I'd be better at negotiating contracts you know I could get royalties for some of my designs like I love designing you know like she, um, Molly Hatch was talking about a narwhal cup that she's been selling for eight years and she gets royalties from it and she gets like eight thousand dollars a year from this like narwhal cup for the past ten years it's like, no, like, I don't have, like, come on, that would, that would be great. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, I, I was thinking about looking into that. Nice. Mm -hmm. Sean, what about you? What numbers are important? What's your path right now? 
Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I mean, starting from my first year when I was still working full time at the bakery, I think my check that year, I mean, full time, I was working really long days because I was making all the croissants for this bakery for a year and a half. Mm. So I only worked four days a week. It's which really good training, to, training for production ceramics, yeah. by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, I wish I could make pots as fast as I make croissants because I think <laughs> in, in a year and a half, I think I made 40,000 croissants was my, was my estimate. Um, so I wish I could make them that fast. But that year, so I worked four days a week there. And I think after taxes, my paycheck from that job was $23,000. I was you know, getting paid $13 an hour. Um, and I was putting a lot of hours there. And that same year, with the summer going crazy and putting my other three days into the studio, I think I did like 30,000 in sales from just the, that basically one location that I was selling out of in the summer. So that's when I said, okay, I'm going full time with the business. Like I sold $30,000 with the pots and I wasn't there. <laughs> they were just- That was the flying off, off the shelves. The shelf. yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so then my first year full-time with the business, um, I think I did 80, 80,000 in sales, which felt really good, you know, but there was a lot of expenses again. Um, and that year I started paying some, some people, um, on the side to do things here and there, um, you know trying to find an accountant. There's a whole nother conversation where I accidentally created a corporation online. So I was a corporation, so I started paying lawyers and, uh, and a bookkeeper and an accountant, and it's all sorted out now. Um, but, uh, you know, as you-, you Legal on, Zoom, folks. <laughs> really, <laughs> super recommend it um, to do. Uh, so yeah, and then the next year I think I was, I'm, did like 150,000 in sales um, the next year. So like doubled it basically both times, but then um, was paying a lot more in expenses. And it's funny how, yeah, you double your sales, but you maybe only go up by 10,000 mm -hmm. in the actual amount that you're paying yourself. And um, I'm at a good place now. Everything's been sorted out. I finally got payroll set up. So I'm paying my employees payroll taxes ahead of time and everything. And um, now I'm actually set up so that I, the business, because I am a corporation, the business pays me automatically on the 15th of the month, $5,000 a month. Nice. So that's where I'm at now. That's rad. And um, it's it, I keep like being unsure, like I hope that there's enough, because it also automatically pays my employees, like I hope that there's enough in the bank account because <laughs> that's what the number that we chose and I'm excited for the summer to come and start selling more pots but um, yeah those are and, and you know it's not again those numbers are great but I haven't been cutting back my hours at all you yeah. know and I like I think you said that's the next thing that we're well, going to get into yeah, that's quality what, of mean, life and like how much you work it's great to be making more but I'm paying more too Yep. And um, at what point is is this sustainable? Can I yep. keep working as hard as I have been yep. forever? Like, you know. Well, how do you think about your sort of future trajectory? And you've mentioned working 100 hours a week a number yeah. of times, <laughs> and like, that's cool yeah. for a little while. Yeah. But you know, you can't do that forever. I've been getting better at it. Once in a while, I take a day off. <laughs> or come to Enseca, you know? But it's actually, I mean, I don't, the one answer is that I don't know. But I am also, I trust my employees more and more, and there are certain designs. None of the marbling, you know, it's all like way too difficult. Like, I can't teach someone else to do that. And like you said, I can't give away that need for, like, I, I will have an issue if someone else marbles something because it's not going to be right. But there are certain products, you know, like just single colored um, cups that I sell through some stores and I have available. And some people love them. I have them in person. I have my employees make all those. So, you know, at some point, it's like if you're getting, I like to think about a business where more of it could be done by other people slowly, slowly as they learn and practice and practice. And I slowly am letting other people try like, I'm not gonna let them carve, I'm not gonna let them marble, 
but they can try it, and maybe at some point they'll get somewhere. So I guess I don't know. Like, um, I don't know where I'm at. I guess mm. in terms of future growth, I kind of yeah. just keep going forward, and um, maybe at some point I need to stop making something. You know, saying this is no longer available, and we're gonna move to do fun new things. <laughs> I don't know. That's where I'm at. Totally. Um, what's the most fun thing or the thing you love the most about your business and your work? Um, the experimentation. I mean, that's always been the thing. When I'm doing something where I don't know what the result is going to be. Um, I'm really excited also, just anything new, you know, I've gotten so far away from my, I throw all my original forms for my prototypes, but I've gotten so far away from my throwing functional pottery background. We're building a wood kiln on the island, on Orcs Island where I live, with a bunch of local potters, where we all have our own studios. We're building a wood kiln, I'm gonna have to make a new line of work for that, or just, who knows, if it's gonna be a line of work for the business, or if it's gonna be just for me, you know, and make some, big honking planters <laughs> that I can put trees in um, for my house. Uh, you know, who knows? It's, it's the fun part. The fun part is anything new and different. And you can't get stuck. That's where the business can be like, you know, how many of these can we make? Maybe I need to step back. What about you, Dustin? What do you love? First part was like, well, I don't, what's the, uh, fun. It's not fun, it's work, <laughs> it's a job. I think that I, um, I'm kind of surprised in myself that I haven't got sick of throwing this space that I make so many of every year that I still enjoy that. Uh, I think a, a fun part is new stuff, right? The sculptural things I do have a better sense of discovery and different processes and are getting into more of a painting kind of realm that's enjoyable. And uh, I also really like teaching. I, I never really expected to find that to be such an enjoyable part of what I do, but I think it's really important. I love having my assistant in my studio and talking about different things because I'm usually solo and to meet my students every week are really great. Uh, the other thing is that I, I, my reaction of like, well, what's fun about this is that <laughs> I, I live in Brooklyn, right? So my expenses are really high and it's very busy everywhere else. But my studio is the most peaceful place in all of Brooklyn because I'm there alone, right? And I can have my private space that I don't share with people that I live with and I don't share with people on the train and I don't share with odd smells blowing down the street. Um, and it's mine and that's really valuable too. Mm. You give it, you give that up when you get employees, though. You know, that's when you when you yeah. grow. Like it's yeah. no longer just I have the weekends yeah. in my studio, but I have to be there to manage. And then you're manager. And then I'm, I'm mm -hmm. yeah. It's it's interesting mm -hmm. how that's changed for me. Liz, what about you? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think the moments of discovery, and um, I also have been practicing enjoying moments in craftsmanship because it's such a huge part of my work and sometimes I get focused on the end result finishing the work getting it fired having it come out perfect um, and that like moment of reveal when everything comes out perfect I found out that actually that's not enough for sure. me to continue to enjoy doing all of the labor but I like so I'll do like a perfect line and I'll be like <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it sounds dorky, but like just really like going in there and just like appreciating all those hours of labor that mm. took it, took me to get to that point where I could do that. And, you know, like there's sun coming in the studio and, uh, you know, like I, I'm just trying to like be in my practice and more. And it's been, mm. it's been nice. It's, it's been helpful. I want to end there. That was good. <laughs> Um, we have time for questions. We don't have a mic, so you're gonna have to kind of shout, and we're gonna kind of wing it. Is that is that a mic? Or oh, oh, that's a mic. <laughs> All right, step right it? up. Oh, great. Should have checked that out. Okay, I guess come come up and make a line, and we'll figure it out. 
Hello, I'm April. I'm Don't just really shy. curious how down. all of you balance your personal life with your business running. If you have any kids, any partners, right. all that business. I mean, for years I've said, thank God I'm single, right? Thank God that, I don't, <laughs> that I'm not dating because I don't know how I would balance it. And now we didn't totally get into the quality of life question, but trying yeah. to walk out the studio door at some reliable time a couple times a week and trying to have, um, my friend and I have a one fun thing per week. He's also self-employed. So to get a day out of the studio to do something cultural or somewhere else. Yeah, it's not a good balance. I'm not. Yeah, it's a constant struggle. I think about it because apparently my eggs are getting old. <laughs> oh, no. so, you know, if I want to do it, I got to you know, really start thinking about it. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a problem, you know. I've been just trying to think about ways of, I don't know, like the passive streams of income, that kind of thing. Like, you know, like how, like how to keep it going when I know, like, very time consuming to raise children. And you know, and they can't be breathing all that dust. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm in a little bit of a different situation also because my partner works in the studio and has been coming there since the beginning because if he hadn't, he would never have seen me. You know, it, I think it was really good when I moved away from the studio. I used to live right above my studio and I could be in there till like 2 a.m. And now someone else lives above my studio. So I kind of like need to leave by 8 p.m. or something like that. Or, or after 8 p.m. I'm very quiet if I need to be there. But yeah, again, definitely trying to set a time where it's like we also got dogs, which, you know, we're managing and got two little <laughs> cute puppies. And so it's like, you know, you have to leave at a, some, at a certain point. And um, yeah, but it's hard, you know, and sometimes we, we work together and uh, that's really great. We get to spend a lot of time together, but sometimes it's too much and we're at each other's throats, you know, right? <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's hard. Next. Oh. Um, am I close enough? Okay. Uh, I guess I was wondering, do you guys ever feel that when you make works that are commercial, intended for like an everyday audience, that it will affect the perception of your work that's kind of meant for the gallery or meant to be art rather than commercial? Hmm. I don't have I, I don't have anything to speak to that suit a whole lot because I do sell functional wares. Like my stuff is made to be used primarily. And I don't have more like display objects. Like, um, I don't know. Yeah, what do you think? Uh, no. <laughs> 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 I just, I really work to, you know, everything comes out of me and it's all important. And um, some things I don't get paid enough for, and I'm visiting that and trying to figure out how I can make it worth it for me. Yeah, I think I had to retrain myself to say no as well because our crafty gut instinct is that art is one thing and product is something else. And I think it's an attitude thing and it's a price tag thing to say, you know, this deserves to have a higher price. This, this functional object deserves to have a higher price no matter what store it's in. Yeah, I guess that's... Uh... I've always wanted to have more pieces, like gallery type pieces, but I don't feel like any of my, because I come from such a functional and I want my things to be used background, it's like I don't have anything that I feel like is gallery worthy, even though some of it maybe could be, you know, I feel like I need, I need to make something bigger, something different than the cup form that I normally make. I even have a large vase. So uh, th there is a separation. That's a whole nother conversation that, um, you know, the gallery versus the, the business, you know, if I feel like gallery pieces don't move in the way that you need pieces to move mm, if you're running a business, that is true. you know, you can't just mm -hmm. be, unless you're, you know, you've been in it forever. And at that point you're only in galleries. You can't just be in galleries and be making enough money is I would think. Uh, 
Uh, you all mentioned different um, different ways that your work enters the world, different sales avenues like wholesale or uh, online or in galleries. Um, if you could pick one of them and you thought you could grow that one three or four times over um, in your revenue and your profit, if you could pick your favorite, uh, which one would you pick? Online. Online. <laughs> why online? <laughs> Sorry, uh, yeah, o online, probably. So, so why online? I, I, mm, I don't know if we're all going to say the same thing. I think it's more on my terms, right? I can pack it and ship it from my studio, and I get to keep the full price. Mm. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a, a lot of uh, profit that you lose selling through a gallery or wholesale, and you also uh, lose uh, a lot of time when you do a show, mm -hmm. like you mentioned, and you, the fees are really Good high. Food. And there's also like some t like food. You eat weird stuff when you're doing a show because you can't be in your kitchen making. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. When you when you sell online, you can still interface with the customer. Like you can still have a really wonderful personal per personable experience. But you get you just get more for your labor. The labor of selling. That's the main thing. Yeah. I mean, and having an employee, it's like my employee can ship it, can print the label and ship. You know, I don't even have to be there necessarily. My employees are shipping stuff today. Um, and so that's that's the main reason. The only other one that I would l would maybe be second if you had the business model for it for me would be wholesale. And I thought that I wanted to do a lot more wholesale because again, you ship it off, you lose. You just have to have the volume, mm -hmm. right? But yeah. you lose a lot of money. But as long as you set your prices, and that they can still sell them, mm -hmm. packing stuff off to stores and having other people selling your work and you're not there and they've already paid you for it is awesome. Um, I like wholesale a whole lot more than consignment because you're like, did they sell something? Mm -hmm. Are they gonna send me a check? You don't know, it's done. So, yeah. Sweet. I think we have time for one more. No. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's pretty quick, I think. I'm a Harlan from Seattle. And, um, my question is, is there, have you found a correlation between the frequency of your posts on Instagram with your volume of sales? Um, I don't know about frequency of posts. I, we, in general, just try to post every day. Um, I think it's more about what the content of the post is for the sales. Like when I post something that is new and people are really excited about, and it's finished, and it's not, uh, Product, uh, a process video. I generally have that lined up with the product going up on the online. So it's like I'm posting what is going to sell, and if people are really excited about thing, it's going to sell really fast. And sometimes I'm really excited about something, and turns out people aren't, and <laughs> then it doesn't sell. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. If if I'm like, oh yeah, I'm this is available, and I'm really it's appointed post, you know, then I'll, I'll receive some sales from that, but in an indirect way, I would suppose so. I've been also trying to post every day, you know, just have that as my practice, and uh, I have noticed there's just a little more hubbub, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm raising a little more hubbub, I'm getting a little more back, you know, and it's, it's indirect, though. Yeah, yeah I would, I agree, I guess. I, I think that that's not totally the point of social media or Instagram to drive sales, but to build that engagement that can lead to sales later. But I was really surprised and disappointed at what my web sales were last year, and that's just where it is. Um, we're at the end, we're but we the also end. wanted to talk can, about, can, speaking can, of promotion and, con and uh, consignment, Sean, where do you have work downstairs? Oh, uh, yeah, so I sell <laughs> at uh, Utexit Gallery, and they have a booth down on the expo, and I think both of my lovely Friends here have worked down there as well. Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah. Nor uh, we're at the Northern Clay Center. Me and yeah. Dustin together. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Okay. Cool. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>